All right, we should be recording now. Yes, okay, excellent. Um, so let's go ahead and begin. Uh, before we before I ask for questions, I wanted to um, mention a few things here, or I guess one or two things here. Um, so on web campus, if we scroll down, um, oh, excellent, thank you. You guys are already doing the attendance. Yeah, definitely type in here if you're here. Um, but if, if we scroll down here, um, this this last module that's that's available that's viewable at the moment is the exam and project. So again, it has the project one PDF. Um, I had that on its own module, but since uh, because I wanted to have that available before, uh, but that's also also viewable here. Um, also with the uh, so we're going over the study guide today, which is this. Um, this PDF document, the study guide for theme one. And when you click on this, obviously it, it will open up the, the study guide. You can either download it or follow along as we go through it uh, today. Um, personally, well, I guess that's, <laughs> this is probably just my, my personal preference, but I usually end up downloading things so I can make notes on, on, the, on the actual document. But um, whatever you're most comfortable with, uh, there was one thing that I that I noticed when I was going through here on on problem seven. Uh, it says below is grandma's favorite cookie recipe, and that was not attached. So if you go back to the module, um, you'll notice there was a, a second document that I uploaded this week, and uh, I apologize for not uploading it sooner because I I failed to mention that. And this is the cookie recipe. So if you open that. This is the cookie recipe we'll be using for that problem, uh, which was uh, problem seven, question seven on the review, um, as soon as this decides to load. Um, yeah, um, to be honest, I actually, uh, I'm not really a baker, so I haven't tried this recipe myself, but um, I'm actually not even sure if it is a real recipe, so I'm not sure if I would be brave enough to try it, but I mean, it is it is there. So uh, that's the recipe that we're referring to in question seven. Um, so again, uh, we'll be going through that today. I believe we'll, we should be able to get through all of the questions. Um, and um, the review, I would say, is probably the thing that I would focus on the most when you are studying for the for our coming exam, uh, since if you can so. Remember for the exam, uh, you need to be able to do the questions without a book, without your notes, and uh, with only using a, a non-programmable, uh, non-graphing calculator like the um, TI-36, uh, 30X2S, uh, the one that, that, one of the ones that was, that was recommended on the syllabus. Uh, if you can do the study guide without your notes and without the book and using only one of these non-programmable non-graphing calculators then you can do the test in, in the same way you shouldn't have any issues with the exam so um and also while you're going through the exam uh um <clears throat> sorry have a, my, my allergies have been acting up with the wind um with the with the study guide, uh, I would try and do it on your own, going through again the process of without your notes and without the book. And if you get stuck, then that is a good indication of where you need to study for the exam. So that's that's good uh, a good way to check that. Um, okay, but I did, I did want to mention uh, mention that. that was there, especially with the uh, cookie recipe that slip up uh, since I uh, did not realize that it was not attached in the study guide, but that has now been uploaded. So if you're wondering what that cookie recipe is, that's for question seven. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and go through the study guide um, today, but uh, before you get to that, let me go back uh, here then. And uh, before you get into that, let me ask if there are any any questions on any of the uh, homework or previous material before we jump into the study guide. Uh, question about the exam, yes. Uh, 
Oh, um, so uh, we won't be, it will, it will, that's a good question. Uh, so the question is, are we doing it during class on Zoom or like, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, but that's all right. Um, we're actually not going to be doing, doing it during class. We won't have, so um, during a regular semester, the exam would take place over the class. So it will be a timed exam. It's going to be 75 minutes. That's how much time we have in class to go over the material. Um, but that will take the place of the class since we would do nothing else on exam day. So for the exam, uh, instead of instead of logging in here to the Zoom uh, lecture, you're going to just open up the exam. Once you click start, you'll have 75 minutes to complete the exam. Uh, and after you have completed the exam, um, preferably that day, uh, you should upload your uh, scratch paper from each problem, uh, which I think there is, let me scroll down here. Yeah, there's the exact one. Oh, I forgot to check. I forgot to change the date on that. I'm going to change the date on that for the exam day, uh, but you'll upload your scratch work here. Um, that's all of the, so basically write down the question, you know, question one, this is what it say, what it says, then write down your, your steps, circle the answer, and then question two. And then once you circle, circle the answer, excuse me, uh, then you'll enter that into web campus for that problem and go into the next one, but you'll be uploading the, the, uh, scratch paper, um, because I, I like to give points, partial points for work towards the correct answer. So if you have like, uh, take for example, if you have the correct formula, uh, but it was not input into the calculator correctly. Um, if you have that, if you have the correct formula written down um, on your scratch paper, then I can give some partial points for that. Uh, again, it has to be worked towards the correct answer. Um, and I will, I will fix that uh, due date. Um, let's see, how many attempts do we uh have? Can Sorry, I yes, ask something more about that scratch work? Is it like we write it down on a paper and then after we're done with the test, we take a photograph with our phone and then we up uh, we upload it? Uh, yes. And, and, and so it's okay because it'll be handwritten. Is that all right? In this case, yes. Um, the only thing that I don't want handwritten are the, are the projects. And that's because you have uh, several, several weeks to, to type those up. Um, but the, for the for the for the exam, I'd be surprised if it was not handwritten. Uh, and I did see a question in the chat: How many attempts do we have? Since this is an exam, there will be one attempt. Um, another question: Is the study guide turned in or just? Oh, so the study guide is just for you to practice. Um, so you don't need to turn it in. Um, if you if you want, to, I think I think we'll be going through those those questions. I think we'll have time to go through all of them. Uh, if we if we don't, then you can send me an email, uh, and we can go through one in more detail, or or come to office hours, um, or uh, go to uh, take for example tutoring, uh, if you are doing tutoring for that. Um, but I, I believe we should have enough time to go through all of the all of the questions. Uh, another question, how many questions will there be? So on the in-class exam, since we have 75 minutes, um, generally my, my exams are 15 to 25 questions and that's including uh, like parts A and B. So you have one A, B, two A, B, for example. Then there would be somewhere between 15 to 25 questions on the exam. And some of those might be a little bit longer, you know, if it's, if it involves a, a formula and some of them might not be as long. Um, any other questions? Uh, I'm trying to clarify just what you just said. So okay. if it's part A and B, does that count as two questions? Um, when I, when I, uh, so. In those 15 to 25. That's yes. Right. When I say the 15 to 25, then yes. Uh, when I'm grading it, I will count it as one question. But when I'm when I say it's 15 to 25 questions, that's the one A and B would count as two questions. So I, I know that's a, a sorry that's a little bit confusing, but I hope, I hope that that clears that up. Um, will there be any multiple choice? Uh, if there is, there will only be maybe one or two questions that are multiple choice, and the rest will be short answer. 
Uh, well, would be technically short answer. So that's why you're going to upload your scratch paper so I can, I can see the work. Um, obviously, if you get the question right, then you've done the work correctly or should have done the work correctly. And I'll see that on your scratch paper. Um, but if you don't have the right, the right solution, again, if there's something like there, there was a mistake in, in putting it into the calculator, then I'll be able to look back and see um, if you have the right answer written down. Um, but for, for, for my exams, I, I actually don't like multiple choice most of the time. Uh, so I try and avoid those since, since um, especially, especially in terms of, of mathematics, because usually with multiple choice, it's either right or wrong. And with mathematics, there, you know, there's steps to get to the right answer. And usually I like to give points for steps towards the correct answer. Um, which you can't do with multiple choice. So I try to avoid those. Uh, I can't guarantee that there will not be any multiple choice questions, but I try to avoid those. Um, any other questions before we jump into the review? And actually, let me, I, let me go back to the other window. So I've downloaded the document here myself. Um, which uh, we'll be switching back. I'll be switching back and forth between the review here and our, our digital scratch paper. Um, I would recommend that you have the, the study guide, but if not, I mean, you can always go through it on your own later. And in fact, I would recommend, recommend that. Okay, I'm not hearing any questions and I'm not seeing any in chat. Uh, I do know there is a little bit of a delay, so I'll keep my eye on chat. Uh, but if there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so the way that this the study guide is set up, so um, so first, you know, this is the study guide for theme one, which means it's for our test one. We're thinking of the themes at theme one as the first third of the semester, theme two is the second third, theme three is the third third of the semester. So theme one covers uh, chapters one, uh, sections A, C, and D, uh, section uh, chapter two sections A, B, and C, and and uh, chapter three sections A and C. Um, so that's that's uh, what is covered on this first exam. That's our theme one material. Uh, now the actual question, when you scroll down, the actual question is the one here in um, that is italicized, uh, but the uh, red or blue uh, tells you what section it is from. That won't be given on the exam. That's just for the on the study guide to give you help with with studying, um, and also possibly. Like for example, here on question two, uh, it gives you some exercises to look at. So this one is from section 1A. And if you wanna see qu uh, se uh, questions in the textbook that are similar to that, uh, if you wanna look at other questions that are similar but not are not this the example we go over, then you'd go to section 1A to the end of section 1A to the exercises and look through questions 11 through 20. And again, the odd ones are in the back of the book. Um, so that's that's kind of how this this is is set up. Uh, but again, we're going to try and and go through this uh, as a class. So let's start with the first one. Uh, so the first one, I'm going to read the question, then we'll go to our digital paper and go from there. Uh, so question one, we're considering the argument. So we're we're given an argument here. Uh, we want, so uh, would you consider this argument to be a logical argument, a fallacy of limited choice, a fallacy of circular reasoning, a fallacy of false cause, or a fallacy of hasty generalization? So that's what we're doing with the argument. Let's read through the argument and see what we have going on. So the argument is, obesity among Americans has increased steadily, as has the sale of video games. It follows that video games are compromising the health of Americans. So that is the argument that is given. Uh, so is, uh, well, when we're analyzing arguments, let's, let's do this really quickly. We always like to uh, identify the premise and the conclusion. So let's identify what is the conclusion and what is the premise or premises. Let's start with the conclusion. Um, so any brave souls want to venture forth what they think the conclusion is for this argument? It follows that the games are comp compromising the health of Americans. Good. Video games are compromising the health of Americans. And what are the premises then? Well, the premises are what is left over. So obesity among Americans has increased steadily, and the sale of video games has increased uh, steadily. All right. So 
good. We can identify the premise, uh, premises and conclusion. Um, next, uh, is this a logical argument or does this argument have a fallacy? And which fallacy? fallacy? It has a fallacy. It has a fallacy. Excellent. Okay. Which which fallacy do we have? False I cause. Would say false cause. I was just gonna say that. Wait, you said good. Said yep. <laughs> in this case, it is false cause. Good. And so in this case, we are using the fact that this, the the uh, obesity has increased following the sale of increase in video games. Uh, the fallacy we are committing is false cause. We are assuming that the video games has caused the obesity, and that is not. Uh, logically sound. Um, that is not evidence. Okay, excellent. So that's question one. Question two. Um, question two, actually, let me uh, let's see, where did I put that? Here it is. I have the book. Um, question one, I actually put down the wrong argument. So I wanted to get the, uh, the correct argument for this one. Um, but question two, what we're doing is we are looking at an, an argument that we are told is uh, fallacious. It has a fallacy. We have to identify what the fallacy is. So um, let's let's go to our digital paper now. And uh, which one is this one? And uh, I wanted to look at um, which one was it? I think this was I think this was question 13 in the textbook. Uh -huh. Let me adjust the page there. Okay. Uh -huh. Put that to that. All right. So question two, decades of searching have not revealed life on other planets. So life in the universe is, uh, must be, sorry, must be confined to Earth. So that's the argument. And we are told that this argument has a fallacy in it. So we have to identify uh, what is, what is the fallacy that is being committed. But again, first, let's look at what is the premise uh, and what is the conclusion. Premise or premises, and what is the conclusion? Let's start with conclusion. Um, usually, the compute is. Sorry, I'd say ahead. the conclusion is that life in the universe must be confined to Earth. That is correct. Conclusion. And usually, uh, when you're looking at these arguments, especially in English, um, usually the conclusion follows so. Because remember, the conclusion is what you are arguing for. So the premise then is what's left. Decades of searching have not revealed life on other planets. So that's our premise. All right. So uh, what do we have here? Uh, what is our fallacy? I'd say the fallacy of ignorance. Ignorance, we don't appeal to ignorance. That. Yeah. <laughs> yep, this is appeal. To ignorance. I see a, a hasty generalization. Um, in this case, not quite hasty generalization. So uh, let's go back to our um, what what our fallacies come from. Uh, hasty generalization is if you have uh, of not enough cases to make a conclusion from those cases or cases that have not been sufficiently analyzed. Uh, but appeal to ignorance, we're using, so in the, notice here, what we're using is, is we, have, we have a lack of evidence. Here's a searching has not revealed life on other planets. That's a lack of evidence. And lack of evidence as a premise, uh, yeah, okay, good. Um, but let me, let me finish that out for, for those that might have the same question. Um, lack of evidence as a premise is appeal to ignorance. So that is our that is our fallacy, appeal to ignorance. Okay. Uh, there was a second question. If you look at the study guide um, after the 
Well, so here we identify the premise and conclusion. We did that. Briefly describe how the fallacy occurs. Well, I, we did that. Uh, I, I should have uh, read that before stating what the, what how the fallacy occurs. But the when it's lack of evidence is used as a premise is is how appeal to ignorance occurs. Uh, the last thing is make up an argument that exhibits the same fallacy. Uh, so any brave souls want to uh, present a. Another appeal to ignorance argument. Uh, yes, I see a hand. Go ahead. Um, I would say, would this be one like, um, since there isn't an, any evidence that God isn't real, therefore God must be real? Yeah, that is that is one. Yep. You're you're using a lack of evidence as evidence, uh, or as a premise. So in this case, uh, there is no evidence that God does not exist. Therefore, He exists, is an appeal to ignorance. So you're using the lack of evidence as as a premise. Very good, very good. Okay, um, so that's question two. Let's go to question that's three. Question that was actually written there about the college. So I won't go to college because my dad didn't go to college mm -hmm. i'm trying yes. to figure out what that could be because it seems like there's some some premises left out or something some implied premises or uh yeah so there uh and that's that's why i didn't like that example um because it does have implied premises in this case uh you're using the fact that one of your other family members has not gone to college uh, so that would be a hasty generalization since you're saying, well, in my family, this one individual, my father has not gone to college. And since it's my family, therefore I will not go to college as well. Um, mm. But there are some hidden premises there. And I, I, I personally don't like the hidden premises. So um, that's why I wanted to give a different example. Um, any other questions on that? And while you are typing, if you are typing, I'll go to back to our review here. Uh, oh, I see a hand. Is that a question comment or is that from earlier? Oh, from earlier, it looks like it's gone now. Okay, um, so let's, let's continue then for question three. Uh, so question three, we're looking at a Venn diagram. This Venn diagram represents the characteristics for an extended family, uh, which are the Hancocks. So, and we notice that is, uh, what the Venn diagram is, is labeled as the Hancock family. We want to know how many in the family do not have blonde hair. So whenever we are analyzing a Venn diagram for information, we want to look at what is the trait we're interested in? And is that uh, one of the sets that is given? Or is that the opposite of one of the sets given? And, and by that, I mean, uh, usually, it'll be either in the set or not. So. Um, in this case, what trait we're interested in is blonde hair. And the two sets that we have is blonde hair, or sorry, we're looking for it does not have blonde hair. And the two sets that we have been given is blonde hair and blue eyes. So those are our two sets. Uh, so the does not have blonde hair, that is the opposite of the blonde hair set. So how can we determine how many in the family do not have blonde hair? You look everything outside of the circle that says blonde hair, basically. Very good. So for question three, oh, let me write this down. For question three, then, since we are given the not blonde hair, what we want to do is we want to look at everything outside of that set, everything outside of that circle. Uh, so we're looking at uh, this area of the Venn diagram, if that's blonde hair. Good. So in this case, going back here, outside of the blonde hair, we have two numbers. We have this number five here at the bottom left and this number 12. So 12 do not have blonde hair and have blue eyes, and five do not have blonde hair and do not have blue eyes. So the number of individuals is 5 plus 12 is 17 do not have blonde hair. Okay. 
What are what are we supposed to put for scratch notes on some of these? Are we supposed to just write out premise conclusion in in the in the uh, appeal to ignorance, or are we supposed to draw the Venn diagram and explain? Or um, so this is not really something you can like show. Right. Um, so what what I uh, write here on the on the page on the digital page is mm -hmm. what I would be looking at in terms of the um, in terms of scratch paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, I mean, for for number two, there is not a lot that you can write, but we'd, um, it is always a good idea to show me that you can find the conclusion in the premise. Um, and here we're emphasizing that the not revealed is a lack of evidence. And so that would be our appeal to ignorance. And then for the for the Venn diagram, notice that we're looking for not blonde hair. So here, um, this Venn diagram, if you were to put this on your scratch paper, it shows me that you know that that's anything outside of the blonde hair circle. And then um, you would probably input the uh, 17. It would probably say blank, do not have blonde hair. And so you'd put 17. Um, so uh, hopefully that answers that question. I know some of these, it's difficult to write, um, to write work for. Um, but you know, writing something is better than not writing anything. And there was a question in the chat. Where do we get the 12? Le okay, let's go back to our study guide. Um, so we have five here in the corner and the other one is here 12 because this is outside of the blonde hair circle, uh, but this is not included in that five because that's all the five is outside of both sets. The 12 here is just outside of the blonde hair set. Uh, so it's 12 that that do not have blonde hair, but do have blue eyes. So the total is 12 plus five. Okay. All right, uh, let's go to, uh, oh, so the five represents individuals that do not have blonde hair because it's outside of that circle. And it's outside of the circle of blue eyes. So those that do not have blue eyes. So anything that is not blonde hair, so like brown hair, red hair, or potentially even colored hair, like um, pink, <laughs> could po could probably be represented there. And those do that, those that do not have blue eyes, so brown eyes or green eyes or hazel. Um, so that would be the five individuals there. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so let's let's continue on then. So number four. Uh, so number four here, we're looking at the opposite of the previous one. We are wanting to create a Venn diagram. So let's uh, first we'll read through and then we'll do it as, uh, as a class. So in a trial of a new vaccine, 100 people were given the vaccine and 50 were given the placebo. Of those given the medicine, so those given the vaccine, 80 never developed symptoms. Of those given the placebo, 10 never developed symptoms. So we wanna make a Venn diagram summarizing the results. I'm actually going to add in an extra step here, um, make a two-way table summarizing the results, and then we'll make our Venn diagram from the two-way table. Uh, and then we have a second, uh, a second part of a question here at the end, how many people re who received the vaccine did not improve? So we'll answer that at the very end. Okay, so let's go to our uh, digital scratch paper here. This one is question four. So first let's write down everything that we have. So here we have a study that is going on. Um, so we'll write down the important information. 100 were given the vaccine and 50, oh, sorry. I have to wait for my program to catch up. 50 were given the placebo. Okay, uh, next, of those given the medicine, so um, given the vaccine, 80 never developed symptoms. Okay, and of those given the placebo, 10 
never developed symptoms. Okay. And so again, I'm, I'm adding in an extra step here because I want to make a two-way table. So we're going to make a two-way table first, and that's going to help us create our Venn diagram. So a two-way table. Uh, so whenever we have a, a, a survey or a, or a study, in this case, we have a, a study given of a new vaccine, um, then we can make a two-way table. So the two-way table, remember, we'll have two variables which uh, represent questions that are asked during the study or the survey. And for that, uh, we look at um, information from the question. And remember, uh, hopefully you remember back from when we were doing that, the variables will, will be an A or B uh, answer. So here's the question, answer A or B. Here's the second question, answer A or B. Um, so notice the first thing that we are told is that we have a vaccine or a placebo. So the first variable would be what did you receive, the vaccine or the placebo? So notice that is A or B, vaccine or placebo. So what is our second variable? If you got the symptoms or not. Good, if you got the symptoms or not. So here we have never had symptoms, no symptoms. So and the opposite of that would be symptoms. So we have symptoms versus no symptoms, which is the opposite of that. Excellent. So the 2A table, we use one of our variables as our columns, the other variable as our rows. Uh, sorry, the answer is to the variables. Um, so our 2A table would look something like this. Oh, let me... Uh, get the right tool here. Uh, so we'd have, we have the vaccine, we have the placebo, and I like to add in a total for the column in rows. Uh, we have symptoms, we have no symptoms, and I, I have to, sorry, scroll down, I have to adjust this so I can actually write no symptoms, and again, total. So this is going to be our two-way table. So here is our two-way table, and we can fill this out using the information that we were given from the question. Okay, so uh, going back, uh, we have written the important information here. 100 were given the vaccine. So the vaccine, under the vaccine column for total, we would have 100. There are 100 individuals that were given the vaccine. Uh, 50 were given the placebo. So for, for the placebo under total, we have 50. Uh, those given the vaccine, 80 never had symptoms. So under the vaccine and no symptoms, we have 80. And then given this placebo, 10 had no symptoms. So under placebo and no symptoms, we have 10. Okay, so that is the information that we were given. First thing that we wanna do is complete the table. And we can do this in any order, really. Well, I guess not any order, but um, you know what I mean. And we can we can start any place in in the in the table to to start. Let's let's maybe start here at the bottom. So 100 total were given the vaccine. 50 total were given the placebo. So there were 150, the sum of that uh, that are in the study, individuals in the study. Uh, next, let's look at. Uh, this part of the table right here, uh, vaccine with symptoms. So how many people that were given the vaccine had symptoms? 20. 20. And why is that? Because 100 subtracted by 80 is 20. Right. Because there were 100 that were given the vaccine and we know 80 never had symptoms. So 100 minus the 80, that's 20, uh, must have had symptoms. What about for the placebo? 40. 40. 40. Good. So, and then we can find the total. So the total individuals in the study that had symptoms, 20 plus 40 is 60. Total number of individuals in the study that had no symptoms is 80 plus 10 is 90. And we wanna ask, does 60 plus 90 equal our 150? Yes. Yes, so our number is checked out. So that is our two-way table for this. Okay, so that's the first first part of that, of that uh, question. What we really want is the Venn diagram. And I use the two-way table as a stepping stone to get there. So next, when we are looking at our, our study, at our uh, either study or survey, we have our two-way table. 
what we want to do is we want to look at um, the question for one of the first variable and commit to one answer. I'm just going to pick the first one. So I'm going to pick vaccine. Although you could pick placebo and you would get a, an equivalent uh, Venn diagram. And then for the second variable, again, we're going to commit to one answer. So I'll just pick the first one, symptoms. Though you could pick no symptoms and you'll get an equivalent uh, Venn diagram. It's just going to shuffle around the numbers. So um, those are the two sets that are going to appear in our Venn diagram. So one set will be vaccine and one set will be symptoms. Uh, notice there are four possible uh, four possible Venn diagrams you could get. Uh, vaccine with symptoms, placebo with symptoms, um, vaccine with no symptoms, placebo with no symptoms. So there are four possible Venn diagrams, um, but it, I'm, I'm just picking the first one here for each one. So that's, that's what I'm doing with that. So let's get a fresh page here and get our Venn diagram started. Okay, so we have our Venn diagram, we have two sets. The first set is the answer to the first question we picked or the answer that we committed to. And the second set is the second answer we committed to. So for this one, we picked, uh, what did we pick? Vaccine and symptoms. So we have vaccine, whoops. Let me pick the right tool there. There we go. Vaccine. And the second one we committed to was symptoms. Okay. Now there are four parts, four regions of this uh, Venn diagram that we have to find. So first let's look at this. Uh, let's start with this middle part. So this middle part, notice we are inside the circle, the vaccine circle, and we're inside the symptom circle. So this region right here in the center represents those that got the vaccine that had symptoms. And looking at our then 2A table, how many with the vaccine got symptoms? 20. 20. That's this number right here. So that goes here. Okay. Uh, another region is this one. So this is inside of the vaccine circle but outside of the symptom circle. So what does this region represent? The people that with vaccine that did not get uh, symptoms. Right, the people that had the vaccine that, did, that had no symptoms. So if we look at our table, <laughs> had the vaccine with no symptoms are 80 individuals. So that's this, this part. Okay, uh, we have this region. So this is outside of the vaccine circle and inside of the symptom circle. So it's those that had, that did not have the vaccine, that is those that got the placebo and those that had symptoms. So we go to our table, those that got the, vac the placebo that had symptoms is this part. So there are 40. And then the last region is this region right here outside of both circles. So here we're outside of the vaccine circle, so those that got the placebo, and outside of the symptom circle, so those that had no symptoms, and that is this number right here is 10. So that goes right here. So this is our Venn diagram. Uh, and just as a note, I believe I did mention this in class, but I want to emphasize it here. Uh, when you're looking to go from the Venn diagram uh, from the 2A table, all of the numbers that show up will be numbers that are not in the total column. So it's going to be the 20, 40, 80, and 10. These other numbers should not show up in your Venn diagram. And so that's why, what we have going on here. Okay, so here is our Venn diagram. All right, and if you have a question, uh, just let me know, otherwise we'll continue on. Uh, so then, the last question that was asked, that is asked on the study guide, and I'm not going to switch to that since I'm just going to read it. Uh, how many people who received the vaccine did not improve? So we want to know how many with the vaccine 
did not improve. By well, that what is you it? Mean they didn't. Uh, you mean they uh, the ones that got symptoms? Well, it doesn't say which exactly. Ones well, didn't. right. So that was actually going to be my next question. What does that mean? If you didn't improve, then you must have had symptoms. So that is exactly right. So you're looking at vaccine with symptoms. So in this case, from our Venn diagram or from the two-way table, how many uh, individuals was that? 20. 20. So 20 got the vaccine and did not improve. Um, and that no, is another way minute, of- Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying that they got the vaccine and then, and then t after they got the vaccine, 20 got symptoms. Yes. So if they have the symptoms already, or I mean, they got it from the vaccine, but they could have symptoms and then improve and get better after the, they've had the symptoms, or they could not improve. It doesn't say this. There's no real answer to that. Well, so... The way that question's worded. Okay, um, that, that's fair. Um, so if you, if you were doing this study, uh, this, this medical study, then, then certainly the way that this is framed would not be the best way to, <laughs> you, you, you're, whoever would be in charge of, of presenting this, uh, this study would definitely um, make you reword that. Um, but in this, in, so, so for, in real life, that, that, is, that is correct. That would, I mean, it's, it's much too vague. In this class, we don't want to make things too difficult. So we're just going to say- um, we just say the ones that had the symptoms. <laughs> Right. So, it, yeah. So we're just going to think of uh, did not improve at meaning that you got symptoms. So, and uh, uh, yeah. So ho hopefully that clears that up. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. Some of these are a little bit, probably not the best, but uh, that's all right. <laughs> okay, next, five. So here we're considering the following deductive arguments. We're told we have a deductive argument. All Labradors love to swim. Rex loves to swim. Rex is a Labrador. So that's our argument that we're given, our deductive argument. We want to discuss the truth of the premises. So we're going to ask, are the premises true or false? Uh, draw a Venn diagram that represents the relationships between the sets and put an X where X belongs to the diagrams. So that's making a Venn diagram of the argument. And last, state whether the argument is valid and whether the argument is sound. Okay, so let's go back to our digital paper here. So this one is questions uh, five, sorry, not six, five. So we have a deductive argument. So we have one premise is all Labradors love to swim. Premise two, Rex is a Labrador. And conclusion, Rex love, oh, nope, sorry. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Premise two is Rex loves to swim. The conclusion is Rex is a Labrador. Okay, I jumped ahead of myself there. All right, so first let's discuss the truth of the premises. So premise one, is that true or false? All Labradors love to swim. I honestly don't know if they love to swim or not. I would guess it's false. There must be some that don't love to swim. Hmm. Yeah, okay. I would. I think that's, that's kind of a hard fun. one to, to be hundred percent sure. I mean, how okay. do you know all love to swim? Maybe. maybe so not. we'll go with false. Uh, I honestly don't know because I don't have a Labrador. I don't either, but I mean, if, even if you did, I think probably a lot of them do, but I mean, to say all, oh, that's kind of. True. And I'm seeing uh, is it's false in the, in the chat as well. So we'll go with false. All right. Um, for the exam, this will be an obvious statement. So <laughs> it will be something science related, like all, all mammals are fish or all mammals are not fish or something like that. Something a lot more obvious. Uh, premise two, Rex loves to swim. 
So here we're going to assume that the person making the argument knows Rex, knows that Rex loves to swim and is not going to lie to us. So we're going to say that premise two is true. So whenever the person making the argument gives you an individual, so in this case, Rex, going to assume that they are not going to lie about that individual. So they're not going to lie about Rex. So in this case, Rex does love to swim. All right. So that's discussing the, the truth of the premises. Second, draw a Venn diagram that represents the relationship. Okay, this is a deductive argument. So we note that premise one, this is our categorical proposition. Proposition, I believe in the book they said all uh, SRP, although you could write it all PRQ. Um, which when we're drawing a Venn diagram is our subset relation S here and P here. So from premise one, our Venn diagram, uh, let's get this started then, is going to be a subset relation. So we'll have a set inside of a set And what is the subset in this case? Well, the subset in this case would be Labradors. And the what that's a subset of are things that love to swim. So that is our uh, first premise as a Venn diagram. So we have our uh, categorical proposition to recall in this case, all SRP. So we can draw that as a, as a Venn diagram. Next, Rex loves to swim. So that's our second premise. We wanna put our second premise into the Venn diagram. So um, where does Rex live in this Venn diagram? According to the second premise, only the second premise, Rex loves to swim. In the swimming circle? In the swimming circle, good. Do we know whether that's inside the Labrador circle or not? No. No, it could be either here or here. So remember, we represent that by putting the X on the boundary line. Okay, so that is our Venn diagram representing the premises of the argument. Uh, the X is Rex and the uh, Venn diagram is our first premise. Now we want to check, does the conclusion match our Venn diagram? Well, for our conclusion, if we were to draw this as a Venn diagram, uh, we would have our Labrador set circle and uh, the X would be directly inside of it. Does that match what we have? No. No because the X could go either way. So this does not match, no. So it is not valid, not a valid argument. Is it a sound argument? No. In this case, it is not sound. So remember, when you are looking at an argument, if it's sound, it has to meet uh, two conditions. First condition, it has to be valid. Well, it's already failed that one, it's not valid. In second condition, all of the premises have to be true. So because this is not valid, we automatically know this is not sound. And that was the last bit, state whether the argument is valid or sound. Uh, so again, we use the Venn diagram to determine that. Okay, so that's question five. Question six. All right, decide whether the following statement makes sense, that is, uh, whether it is true or does not make sense, that is false. And explain your reasoning, so that's just using the, the unit analysis to determine that. So the statement is as follows, it's a two-sentence two statement. The recommended amount of water for an adult is 64 ounces per day. I like to buy in bulk, so for the week, I will need 24 liters. And the note here gives us a conversion factor. There are 33.8 ounces in one liter. Okay, so let's go to our digital paper. I think we need a fresh one here. 
And let's write down the, in, the important information. So this is question six. And we're asking, is this true or false? So that is what we are looking at. And we have two, it's a two sentence statement. So the first, the first sentence, the first part of the statement is an adult needs 64 ounces per day of water. The second statement is, uh, I will need 24 liters. So it's basically saying uh, 24 liters per week for the week is enough, is enough water. So again, we have a, we have a sentence, a statement that is two sentences. The first sentence says, um, what is needed is 20, 64 ounces per day of water. And the second statement, second part of the statement is 24 liters for, uh, per week for the week is enough water. And we are given, there are 33.8 ounces per one liter. Okay, so that's our conversion factor. Well, so when we are looking at a question like this, in order to compare these two things, because we're comparing uh, what is needed to what we have or what we think should be enough, we want to look at the uh, units. Here we have ounces per day. Here we have liters per week. So we can't compare these unless we have the same units. So we have, again, we have four, four options for uh, figuring out whether this is uh, true or false. We can convert both to ounces per day, both to liters per day, both to ounces per week, or both to liters per week. Because again, for our, for our amount, we have liters or ounces, so we need that to match. And for our time unit, we have days or weeks, we need that to match. Uh, so in this case, let's go to, uh, let's do liters per day. So I'm just picking one. You don't have to choose that one when you're doing the exam. Well, no, let me restate that. Uh, read, read the question and it might have you state, uh, it might have you convert this into a specific unit. So just um, be aware of what unit you're converting it to. If it just says true or false, then you would skip that part. You could pick whatever you wanted to convert it into, uh, one of those four options. So the first one we have, we have whoop, my program is frozen. We have, oh, maybe it's not frozen, hold on. Okay, I think, oh, there we go, now it's working, 64, okay. 64 ounces per one day. We want this to be in liters per day. So the, uh, the, the time unit is fine. We wanna convert the ounces. So for our conversion factor, we're gonna use this one, the 33.8 ounces per one liter. And the ounce, does that go on the top or the bottom for our conversion factor? The bottom. The bottom, bottom. why? So they could cancel out. So they will cancel out, exactly. So here the 33.8 goes with the ounces and one goes with the liter. So those will cancel. And so we take our calculator, unless you want to do this by, uh, by hand or in your head, 64 divided by 33.8. And we get 1.89, let's do two decimal places, liters per day is needed. Okay, let's do our second statement. So our second statement is that we have 24 liters per one week. And we want to change the units to be the same. So we want liters per day. In this case, the liters is fine. It's the time unit that's different. So we have week. Uh, well, we know there are uh, seven days in a week. And so we're gonna use that conversion factor. We'll put week here at the top. So the weeks will cancel and days here at the bottom. Again, we want the weeks to cancel. And we know there are seven days per one week. So we divide by seven. And so we have 24 divided by seven we get, let's do again, two decimal places, 3.43 liters per day 
is enough. Okay, so we have now changed our statement to 1.89 liters per day of water is needed. So 3.43 liters per day of water is enough. Is that true or false? That's true. That's true. So this is a true statement. If it was less than the 1.89, if we didn't have more than 1.89, then it would not be enough and the then the statement would be false. Okay. So that's question six. All right. Let's go back to our study guide. So this one, uh, six, we're converting units into the, we're converting two measurements into the same unit. Um, in this case, we chose uh, liters per day. Uh, seven, we're looking at uh, grandma's cookie recipe. So that was the second, excuse me, the second document that was uploaded. You only have nine eggs and want to make as many cookies as you can. And we want to find the necessary amount of baking soda. So let's go to our cookie recipe. So here is the cookie recipe. So first we want to identify eggs. Um, notice here this uh, one batch makes 24 servings. Uh, although this one doesn't mention serving, so that we don't need, but it does mention in, an ingredient. So we want to find that ingredient, in this case, two eggs. So let's go to our digital paper here. And this one is question seven. So we have nine eggs. And the recipe needs two eggs. Okay, so that was the first the first information that we had. So we have nine eggs. We want to make as many cookies as possible. And looking at the recipe, the recipe needs nine eggs. So we're going to figure out how many batches of the recipe we can make. So we have two eggs per batch times the number of batches equals nine eggs. So we divide by two, and we get that the number of batches that we're making is 4.5. So we're making 4.5 batches of the recipe. Okay, next we wanna know, uh, again, I'm, I'm gonna try to not go back to the study guide since, since that's for the sake of time. Uh, we wanna know how much baking soda we need. So we look for the baking soda. Well, what we could do, uh, we, could, we could find the amount of each ingredient we need. Since we know that we're making four and a half batches, we just multiply each one of these by 4.5, four and a half and that would give us the amount of that ingredient we need. But in this case, we're interested in specifically in the baking soda. So notice here, one batch requires one teaspoon of, of baking soda. So let's go back to our digital paper. One batch needs one uh, teaspoon of baking soda. So we need how many, uh, how many teaspoons? 4.5. 4.5 or four and a half teaspoons of baking soda. Good. Okay, so there is our, our solution. All right. Let's go to question eight. Go back here. So that was our cookie recipe. Back to our study guide. Question eight. The Greenland ice sheet contains about 3 million cubic kilometers of ice. If completely melted, that, uh, this ice would release about 2.5 million uh, cubic kilometers of water, which would spread out, we're going to assume evenly, over Earth's 340 million square kilometers of ocean surface. We want to know how much would the sea level rise. Okay. Now here, I'm going to say uh, we want to follow the first rule of mathematics, which I don't think I have told you guys about yet. The first rule of mathematics is don't panic. Because when you panic is when bad things happen. So don't panic. Uh, let's break this down into what we are looking at. So here we are given 
2.5 million cubic kilometers of water. So notice that is we have cubic kilometers, that's a volume. And we want to know uh, this would spread out evenly over 340 million square kilometers of ocean surface. That's a, that's a surface area, uh, square kilometers. And how much would the sea level rise? That's a, a depth or a height, depending on how you want to label it. So we can represent this in a, in a simplified way. Let me uh, write this, number eight. Can write, we can write this in a simplified way as we have the surface area, I'm going to just think of that as a rectangular area. And this is going to cause the uh, depth to rise a certain amount. So here is the uh, depth. And here we have surface area. And we're given volume. So notice that volume is the surface area. Sorry, I'm a little bit too fast for my program. Surface area times the depth. Okay, and what we are given is we're given that the volume is 2.5 million cubic kilometers, so kilometers cubed. We're given that the surface area is 340 million kilometers squared, and we want to know what is the depth. And so in this case, again, we're, we're thinking about this in, in a simplified term. Uh, if we have a surface area and we're adding a volume to this, then, then it's going to rise a certain amount. And so we, we just recall the relationship between volume, surface area, and height or depth is this equation that we have. And so we're going to just apply this to this equation. Okay. I thought I saw a hand, but I'm not seeing it anymore. So I'll continue. Uh, yes, question. I was going to say, what about the ice, the 3 million ice? Um, so that, um, that first statement we can ignore oh, okay. uh, because so um, in, in terms of, so if this was a scientific, if this was a science class, science-based class, we would look at uh, the relationship between ice and water. We know that, uh, or hopefully we know from previous the classes that ice expands when it, when it, when it freezes, that water expands when it freezes into ice. Um, so we, we, we should have more ice in terms of volume than we do have of, of water in terms of volume. Uh, but for the sake of this question, since we're asking how much the surface area would, would rise of the ocean, we're just worried about the water. So we can ignore the ice completely. Um, so hopefully that clears that up. OK. Um, all right. So we're just going to plug in these values into our equation. So we have 2.5 million kilometers cubed equals 340 million kilometers squared times the depth. I'm just going to use D for depth. So let's divide both sides by the 340 million kilometers squared. So on the right hand side, that will cancel completely. So the kilometers squared cancel, the millions cancel, and the 340 cancels. On the left-hand side, the millions will cancel. Kilometers squared will cancel with two of those, leaving us with just one kilometer. And so we have then the depth, or the rise, is uh, 2.5 divided by 340 kilometers. So the depth is 2.5 divided by 340 kilometers. We plug this into our calculator. So we do 2.5 divided by 340. And we get 0, 0.00, let's do two digits that are non-zero, or three digits that are non-zero, seven, three, five kilometers. Or if we want to put this into uh, meters, just recall there, 1,000 meters per kilometer. 
So we could say that the rise in the depth would be 7.35 meters. Okay. That's question eight. Um, I'm in this sorry, case, uh, when how do we know which which uh, unit you want the answer to be in? That's a good question. I was actually just going to to say that. Um, I'm going to say in the it'll be either in the question write your units in in this case meters, or um, if you look at where you're entering the answer on Web Campus, it will say blank meters, so it'll have the units right there. Um, Oh, Hopefully so both. Carefully. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'll try and do both. Um, but sometimes I, even if I intend to, sometimes I, I uh, miss something while I'm double checking. Uh, but I'll, I'll try and include it in both. But yeah, uh, just be careful about reading it. And again, if you if you get it wrong, uh, just because you didn't, I mean, if you have all of the right, uh, right answer, uh, right work, but then didn't see the conversion to the units. Maybe you'd you'd miss one point. Um, so, and I see a hand. I was gonna ask um, if the problem does it specifically say like to round like two decimal places. You could just do it however you want. Um. So yes, it, it in in general, if it doesn't say, then you could do however many decimal places you want. Um, but. Because this is going to be in Web Campus, in order to get the answers to line up, I'm going to have to ask for a certain number of digits. So I'll I'll, I'll specify um, how many digits I want you to round to. Usually, I have two digits um, that I want you to round to. Okay, let's go back to our study guide. Uh, we are really close to being finished. Uh, I think we'll make it. We might have to skim through some of these, but we can we can make it. So number nine, we have uh, out of 10,000 teens, ages 16 to 18, surveyed in 2008, 555 used marijuana on a regular basis. And in 2017, the same survey, so again, uh, surveying 10,000 teens, reported 1,000 uh, used the drug on a regular basis. So we want to find the absolute and relative, relative <laughs> can't, can't talk, relative change between 2008 and 2017. Okay, so let's go to our scratch paper. So for nine, in 2008, we had 555 teenagers used. In 2017, we had 1,000 used. And we want to find the absolute and relative change. Okay. So the absolute change, if you recall, is the new value minus the reference value, or the new value minus the old value. And in this case, um, would we expect it to be positive or negative? Let me let me say that while I'm writing this. So looking at it could be either depending on the uh, the amounts but like this case it, it will be positive but something else exactly might be negative. exactly right yeah it does it does depend on the on the problem in this particular case though the number going from the old value to the new value increases so it should be positive okay very good um so we do the 1000 minus 555 we get 445 so that is our absolute change all right, for the relative change, this is our percent. We do the 1,000, the, the uh, new value minus the old value or the reference value divided by the old value or the reference value, sorry. I keep saying old value, uh, the book says reference value, times 100 to get us into percent form as soon as my computer catches up. Uh, and so we plug that into our calculator and that will be the 445 divided by uh, 555 and then times 100 and that's round to two decimal places 80.18 percent and again that'll be positive because there was an increase so the amount of 
uh, usage increased by 80.18%. Okay. Let's go to question 10. So question 10, this is uh, mini project three, which I believe is due this weekend. Uh, so you may not have, have done this yet, or maybe you have, let's go through it really quickly. So in this question, we have a hypothetical class um, where a student uh, has performed in the class. This is take, for example, a student's uh, homework average in this hypothetical class. This was their test one score and so on. So we have two things that are given. We have the weight of the grade category. So the homework in this, in this hypothetical class has a weight of 10%. And the students uh, grade, the, their homework average was a 97. And what we want to do first is uh, compute the student's cumulative grade. What is their final grade in the course? So um, let, me, let me just try and summarize this quickly. Again, this will be, this will be repeated in, in mini project three, but I'll, I'll try and, and make this quick. Uh, we want to think of the final grade. Uh, it is going to be a percent, but we want to think of it in terms of uh, grade points. So I want to think of for homework, the student will get a certain number of grade points for the mini project will get a certain number of grade points. And then the sum of all those, let's say if it was 65 points, they would have a 65%. And so there's going to be 100 points possible because again, it's going to be a percent. Uh, what we do to find the grade points for each category is take the weight uh, and the grade. So for homework, we would want 10% of 97. That will give us the number of grade points for homework. So maybe let's uh, write that on our digital paper. And again, I'm going a little bit quick because I want to try and get this, uh, get the main idea down for you before the end of class. So we want 10% of 97 for the homework grade points. And when we are taking 10% or some percent of a number, we write that as a decimal. So the 0.1 is the decimal form of 10% times 97. That gives us 10% of 97 is 9.7. Okay. And what we would do is we're going to look at what are the grade points for each category. So for the homework, we'd got 9.7. We do that for many projects. We take 10% of 84, that's going to be 8.4 and so on. Uh, the only one that's different percent in this hypothetical class is the final exam, which is 20%. So 20% of 62, remember we take the decimal form times the number, so that's 0.2 times 62 uh, to get us the grade points for that. So we take the sum of those and let me I'll, I'll give you the solution so that you can verify this. And if you have issues, let me know and, and we can take a closer look. Um, but what you, uh, uh, so the grade is the sum of all grade points. So once you find the grade points for each category, so take the 10% of the 97, the 10% of the um, of the 84 and so on, you take the sum of all of those, you add all of those together. And what you will get for this one is, let's see, where did I put that? Of course, when I'm trying to be quick is when I can't find it, 76.6. 76.6. .6. And so the 76.6%, percent uh, sorry, so 76.6 .6 is the sum of all of the grade points in this particular example. And so that would be a 76.6%. Um, further, if you were looking at this hypothetically to find the, the letter grade, you would go to the syllabus and see what the breakdown is for the percent corresponding with what letter grade. For this, for this course, that would be a C. Okay. So that's this first part. The second part is compute the student's cumulative, oh, sorry, that's what we did. Assume the student has not taken the final exam and wants a C minus in the course. So for that, you're going to assume that the final exam has not been taken. So that's uh, an X, some variable, we'll put X. 
everything else we know. And we want this, the student wants to get a 70%. So here, what we would uh, look at for the second part is the grade is going to be uh, the grade points up to that point. So the grade points, not including the final, plus uh, the percent of the the percent of the weight of the final exam. The final exam is twenty percent. So twenty percent of X. And so here we would have uh, point two times X. And then you'd plug in what what we want. So the, the student wants a 70%. So the grade would be 70. The grade points here is going to be all of the grade points, not including the final exams. You, you'd find those the same way. You take the sum of all of these grade points, except you're going to ignore the final exam. You're not going to add that in. And what you will get for that is a 64.2. So you'd have 64.2 grade points and not including the final. And then you solve for x. You minus the 64.2, divide by 0.2, and you get that x is 29. So the student needs uh, needs 29% uh, on the final exam or better to get a 70% or better in the class. And again, that, that's really quick because we're running out of time here, basically out of time. Uh, but I wanted to get the main idea there for you. So uh, go through this problem in detail on your own. Make sure that you can get the, the first part, grade points. Again, you're adding all of the grade points together to get the, the grade. And then for the second part, you're using this equation. The grade is the grade points uh, plus the percent of the grade category you're looking for. In this case, 20% of the final, so 0.2 times x. And then you plug in what you have. So we want the grade to be 70. So that goes there. We have the grade points without the final is 64.2. And x, the uh, final exam score, is what we are looking for. So you would subtract the 64.2 from the 70 and from both sides. And then you would divide um, the 0 0.2 into the 70 and into the x. Uh, into, yeah, into whatever you get when you, after you've subtracted the 64.2, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which when you subtract, so 70 minus the 64.2 is 5.8 and then divided by 0 0.2 is 29. Um, okay, uh, really quickly, sorry. Um, and then I'll go for questions. The last part is define accuracy and precision. Uh, so that we did in, in section 3C, I believe that was our uh, last section that we went over. So I would uh, check the notes or your book for the definition of that. We don't have enough time to go through that. Uh, but that was the last question on our review. So we got through most of that. Um, any last minute questions then on this last question or on the review before I let you guys go? Okay. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for your patience. Um, we did take roll. So if you haven't typed in, thank, uh, not, <laughs> sorry, you're welcome. If you haven't typed in here into the chat, be sure to do that before you leave. Um, our next class will be the exam. So I'm going to, uh, send out an email on, on what to do for that. Um, make sure when you take the exam that you, uh, do write down the question, your steps and circle the answer, because you'll be submitting that scratch paper to me. Uh, after you take the exam. Uh, that doesn't have to be done in the 75 minutes when you take the exam, but should be done after you complete it. So the uh, uploading the scratch notes is not part, of, should not be, should not take up the 75 minutes for the exam. Um, again, I'll send out an, informa uh, an information on the exam through an email uh, probably this weekend, and uh, that will be our next class. Um, if you have any questions, you can always send me an email or come to office hours, digital office hours. Otherwise, have a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend, and I will see you not Tuesday, but Thursday of next week. Wait, uh, why not Tuesday? Because uh, Tuesday you'll be taking the exam, so that will take the place of class. Oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm dumb. Okay, thanks. No, that, yeah, that, that's all right. Uh, I think I, I, I hope I said that. Well, that'll be in the email that I send out tonight. 
or <laughs> this weekend. So, so we'll, we'll, be, we'll be doing that in lieu of the class, in other words? Yes. Yep. Because okay. uh, if this was an in-person class, then that would be what we do for class. And since we're doing online, it's just going to take the place of the of the lecture instead. And can you do that earlier in the day or does it have to be at the exact time of the class? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think, I believe that there are some of us that are in different time zones. Um, so I think I will have it available for 24 hours. Once you hit, once you hit start, you'll have 75 minutes to complete it. But uh, I think I'll have it available for 24 hours because I know that some, some of us, uh, since we're not doing this in person are on different time zones so okay thank you mm -hmm. all right thank you professor thank you thank you everyone for your patience and have a wonderful weekend i will see you on thursday